This is, um, this is uh, the American gulag. It's about slavery, or the institution of it here. Um, this one will be followed in February. Uh, interesting that this, this year marks the 400th anniversary of, of the institution of slavery. Well, when the Dutch bring the first 20 blacks here as slaves and deposit them in Jamestown. Uh, but uh, it's kind of set the stage for where you are now in this country with regards to race. I mean, let's be honest, your blacks are still second-class citizens. We can't seem to overcome that. But at the same time here, uh, in February, uh, you know, April comes up here, April 20, uh, is the 130th anniversary of Adolf Hitler's birth. So I'm going to do four weeks of Hitler in February. Yeah, it gets better, huh? <laughs> and April 20, I'm pretty well fluent with because that was my father's birthday. Yeah, the same day Hitler. Anyway, uh, this idea of the American gulag, I f you know, the, the, uh, the, the first handout here has a couple of um, quotes. And I have one word before each quote, and I darken the word so it, you don't miss it. Myth and fact. And myth, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I end this by stating this as the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. Note how this is spelt here because that's how it actually appears. And that's actually the, the title of the Declaration of Independence. And then fact, which I got from probably one of the greatest Westerns ever made, The Magnificent Seven. Uh, where Yul Brenner, uh, where Eli Wallach, if you remember him as the bandit chieftain, when he first meets the seven, the Magnificent Seven in that little Mexican village led by Yul Brenner, and they're discussing the merits of defending the village or taking the spoils. And Eli Wallach says, probably one of the, I think one of the greatest lines in any movie, because it's true, if God did not want them sheared, he would not have made them sheep. That's some line. That really is some line. And so this is basically what you're seeing here. Now, slavery has been with us, uh, you, you don't even really know when this starts. You know, uh, one of uh, man's oldest perversions, I guess. But slavery has come in many guises and many forms. Uh, could be based on religion, could be based on Prisoners of war, prisoners of war. Uh, you know, many, many times slave, slavery is not racially or ethnically inspired. Uh, believe it or not, some of the Arabs, uh, Arabs and the Moors come, uh, come to mind here. You know, at, in actuality, as opposed to Europeans later on, they really could care less if you were black, white, or whatever you are. Oh, we got a slave here. We can buy him, sell him, whatever the case may be. And I'll get into that more next week. But the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, slavery here, uh, here uh, really becomes racial. Really becomes racial. And so when you go back to 1619, when the, and the Dutch and the Portuguese really, really own the shop here at this point. Portuguese really got into this first before the Dutch, and they are grabbing people from the African continent. And keep in mind here, too, at the bottom of that first page, or, or when you get to the bottom of the second page with the numbers here. Now, it depends on what source you consult. You know, most sources I see say that there were eventually 10 to 11 million blacks taken and brought to the West. Only about 650,000 were brought here. And so I think, that needs to be, I think that needs to be understood. Many of them were going to the Caribbean and Central and South America. Now keep in mind here the, the weather, the environment, in some of those Caribbean islands in Central and South America, 
was a lot rougher on slaves than the South. And so, in places like Haiti, Jamaica, places like this, uh, Central America, these places ate slaves like peanuts. So that this is one of the major reasons you have this constant trade. You, got the, you, you, you have to keep up with the attrition rate. And then on some of these ships bringing people over, I mean, they're stuffed. They're stuffed into the holds here. And it wasn't unusual to see on some of these voyages blacks taken and stuck on these ships. Uh, I mean, keep in mind, sanitation is not a prerequisite here. I'm sure you can, I'm not going to go into that. I'm sure you can draw your own conclusions here with regards to that. But people sometimes got, or some of these Africans became melancholy and actually threw themselves over the side. And let's understand how some of these people were taken too. You know, you have, well, just like here, uh, stateside, before it's the states, the Indians, weren't they here before the white man? Did all of these tribes get along? No. So was there warfare between the tribes? Yes. You know, are they kind of a mirror image of the tribal and clannish situation in what you call the Middle East and North Africa? Yeah, there sure is. Sure is. But is that going to help the white man defeat the Indian here eventually? It sure will. But Indians were used as slaves here, too, and I'll get into a little bit of that, although that didn't quite work out that well. But the, the fact of the matter is that the, the Portuguese and the Dutch really are the leaders here at this point with the slave trade. However, keep in mind here in, in North America here, especially in the, the, southern, the southern part of or the, the North America, where also indentured whites were doing a lot of this work. But of course, that's going to change. And there are going to be two major reasons for that change. And you can see where this is impacting almost everything man, what the white man, the European, is doing. The Industrial Revolution and capitalism. It's changing everything, especially like in England at this point. England is, you know, is undergoing the Industrial Revolution, and so where is slavery going? It's going down. Who's replacing the slave here? The wage earner, the factory worker. Of course, that's going to lead to other economic and political problems, I'm sure as you well know. But man's society and economy and politics are going to be affected by this. Can't help but be. Can't help but be. However, as they're developing the new world, what are some of the major products that are being developed? Agrarian. You think there's going to be a lot of factories on Haiti? <laughs> no. What's going to be on Haiti? Plantations. What are they looking? What are they doing? Sugar. Sugar. You need people for that. It's labor intensive. I always, found, I always find this uh, striking here, you know, when you go back to you know, man's, man's advancement with regards to his technology and the Industrial Revolution. You know, when you take a look at what, at what the white man is doing here, especially in the South, and what was going on in those islands in the Caribbeans, you know, very, very labor-intensive to put out a product. And yet, when you look at the 20th century, you know, I always go back to a, a good old Joe Stalin here when in 1926, you know, he understands another war is coming. You know, the Versailles was a big fraud anyway. And he understand, and so he's got to industrialize the Soviet Union. You know, as opposed to what you're seeing in the, in the 17th and 18th centuries, Joe comes along and he sees what other countries are doing. Why should we be using horses and mules to plow the fields? Why aren't the peasants using tractors? You're now in the era of the internal combustion engine and oil. Can't you produce more food with, with tractors than you can horses and mules? Yeah, you can. You can. 
And I, I always, I'm always fascinated by how man seems to improve his lot here. It's fascinating to see this, this horizontal progression. But here in the 17th century, that's not the case. And so as the slave trade takes hold, again you see, again though, like in places like England, the Industrial Revolution, there's more reliance on the wage earner. That's not happening here yet. Is it going to? Yes. Yes, it will. But another aspect that changes this, it's not only, you know, the, the, the idea of the Industrial Revolution is that the white man is grabbing more land here. 18th century, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century. Manifest destiny here? Is that going to impact slavery? Big time, because now you need more bodies. You need more bodies. But in the, but in the 18th, 17th century, you see here another aspect besides the fact the white man's going to be gra begin grabbing land, the 1664, 1677, 1667 Anglo-Dutch War. The English virtually take control here of the slave trade for the most part. They beat, they beat the Dutch. And I, I used to work with a fellow. The fellow's name was John Edson. He came from Massachusetts. And going into, uh, this was a guy who was in the merchant marine at one point. He was the maintenance engineer of this place I worked at. I was the traffic manager. He was the maintenance engineer. The guy made 20 crossings on the SS United States. He was in the Merchant Marine. And I asked him about his family background. And he says, he says my family is, goes back to the Revolutionary War era. And he said, he says, I have a great, 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 whatever it is, grandfather, if you want to call him that, who was a captain of a ship. And guess what he was doing before the American Revolution? Bringing slaves here. He said he would leave Africa with a boatload of slaves, bring them across. He would pick up freight here and then go to England. So that trip was paid for. Drop it off, go back to Africa, pick up another boatload of unpaid toilers, bring them across the Atlantic, freight, Back to England. That was that triangle, as they used to call it. And this is what you're going to see. And as more land is taken, more bodies are needed, you're seeing less reliance on white indentured servants and more reliance on what? Africans. I'm going to get to that. That's a good point. I'm going to get to that. But here you see also... The red man has tried. The Indian. Aren't they here? Sure, why not? Let's use them. Right? There's a problem with the Indian. The Indian, uh, you know, some of them very haughty, very arrogant. We're warriors. We don't, we don't pick cotton and rice. and That's woman's work. We're braves. That's woman's work. And so the Indian doesn't quite work out as well. There's another problem here with the Indian, too. Supposing the Indian escapes the clutches of the overseer. He's on his own home turf. Supposing you get a few of them who escape, a number of them. Now you might have a guerrilla band to contend with. That's a problem. You know what the Brits used to do? The British used to sometimes export them to the Caribbean. Uh, that'll learn them. Yeah. I mean, this is an institution that <laughs> knows no bounds here. And as this institution grows, with the more, more land being taken from the Indian, and you need more bodies to pick these crops, obviously here, and plant and plant and sow and so on and so forth, there's obviously more money to be made. Why? Interesting here, interesting here too. You go to the, the, um, the Tidewater area, Chesapeake Bay area, and Virginia, Maryland, northeast section of North Carolina, tobacco. And you can see again, with the expansion of land, you need more hands to process this stuff. 1619, 20,000 pounds of tobacco was exported. 20,000 pounds. By 1,700, 38 million pounds. 
And interesting here, too, through the 18th century, the annual cultivation was anywhere from 25 to 60 million pounds. Now, the tidewater area is great. The land is lush, and there's a lot of rivers. All you got to do is all you got to do is process it, load it, and down it goes. Wow. How about rice? Rice. Rice exports mainly from South Carolina and later Georgia. 12,000 pounds in 1698, 18 million pounds by 1730, and 83 million pounds by 1770. This takes a lot of bodies, folks. A lot of bodies to process this. Now, getting back to your question, yeah, the more, but the more slaves there are, doesn't that raise the population of the amount of toilers you have here? Yeah, sure it does. And again, the, the plant, for instance, in 1680, black slaves in Virginia, 1680, 7% of the population, yet 44% by 1750. But the deeper the south you go, the less people there are. I'm talking about whites, that is, because it's not fully developed yet. And so, yes, uh, in South Carolina, the population in that same time frame, 1680 to 1750, blacks go from 17% to 61% of the population. But, of course, who has the guns? The white man, not the black man. Well, some people will be taken. Some, though, are the products of tribal warfare. Yeah, there were tribes that were taking people from another tribe and turning them over to the traders. That went on. Interesting how sometimes that is conveniently forgotten for whatever the reason. That went on. That went on. Yeah, that's true, but unfortunately for some, I mean, you talk to, talk to, talk to almost anybody in this room here. And, and they can tell you, yeah, my, my, my antecedents came from uh, Germany, they came from France, they came from England, they came from Russia, they, they come from maybe even Puerto Rico, whatever the place may be. You talk to some blacks, they don't know. Why is that? It's been expunged. How do you know somebody wasn't from the Congo? How do you know somebody wasn't uh, from some other place in Africa? Some of them don't know. Because that, that, that so a family heritage here? It's blank. That's part of what you see here. And they're usually around the, the western coast area, Gold Coast, Angola, places like this. And I'll have a map next week which will show you because I'm going to get it, because next week gets into the institution of it itself. I mean, today is really the expansion of this. And so by the time you get to the American Revolution, you got about 650,000, almost 700,000 people here. Now, keep in mind, during the American Revolution, uh, you, you are beginning to see here uh, what's going to develop here in this country, uh, what's going to be a country after the American Revolution. That agrarian agenda in this country versus the Hamiltonian agenda. You know, the agrarian is the salt of the earth. That is the Jeffersonian agenda, the farmer as opposed to Alexander Hamilton's idea of industrializing this country, financialization, so on and so forth. Interestingly enough, too, uh, there, were, there, was, there was talk about raising up blacks against the whites here. You know, but then again, many of your Tories, some of your Tories who lived below the so-called Mason-Dixon line also had black slaves. And maybe that's the last thing they want to hear. But then again, you know, the British are trying to keep control of this, but they have a problem too. Keep in mind, they're also going into the Middle East. They're also fighting the French in, 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 in India, the crown jewel of empire. They're stretched. That's one, of the, that's one of the major reasons why the so-called American colonists are going to win this war, because the Brits are stretched. They're moving into the Middle East as well 
And so the British are stretched. They're a superpower of the time, but they're stretched. But you really don't get an uprising of blacks against the British or joining the white colonists to throw the British out. In fact, at one point down south, 10,000 10, blacks will want to leave here. And they are thinking that when the British get us out of here, what's that? Freedom? No. Guess where a lot of them wind up? In the Caribbean. Gee, thanks a lot. No. So they don't get the freedom. And so it, it, it may be as rough as this sounds, maybe they were better off here. I'm talking climate-wise. Because this climate was, let's, let's put it, let's be honest here, this climate was softer than the climates down in the Caribbean. I mean, the, 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 the diseases down there, the, you know, the, they're horrible. Especially if you don't have the medical care. Plus, you know, the sugarcane plantations, you know, these people cutting the sugarcane, suppose they get a finger or a hand lopped off. You think they really care about caring for these people? Well, we'll just bring more bodies in and replace so-and-so. And so, interestingly enough, too, there were slaves up here in the north. It was a different, it was a different environment, though. Many people had one, two, maybe three slaves. And the biggest areas for that, believe it or not, one of them was Rhode Island. Of course, some of the slaves coming in from Africa came through Portsmouth. New York, well, New York City, that was a port. And so there were farms in New York that had a slave or two or three. And even people living in cities had slaves. Of course, again, the slave here has it noticeably easier than his brother or sister down south. And so these people, some of these people, lived in the house of the people they were being used by. They were doing a lot of the cleaning, some of the cooking, taking care of the kids. You know how that goes. And so it was an easier environment. They're still slaves. They don't have any freedom. They don't have any freedom. They're still slaves. However, again, in the north, again, following the war, this movement towards industrialization. What do we need slaves for? We're putting people to work. And so what's happening, what was happening, and is still happening in England at this point, is now happening up north. Not so the south. Not so the south. In fact, some states later on, up in the north, well, outlaw slavery. You know, states later on, like Vermont and uh, New Hampshire, so on and so forth, will eventually outlaw slavery. What do we need slaves for? And so that's further going to delineate that line, you know, again, as this country begins to expand. You know, we know we're no longer seen, overseen by the British. We're no longer subject to the crown. This is a nation. 13 colonies, 13 states, right? Well, what's going to happen to come along here? As these new territories, you know, people are moving west. Some, some are practitioners of slavery, some are not. But it's the great march west. Manifest destiny here? Either way, they're taking land from the Indian. Either way, they're taking land from the Indian. But as, as that march south Southwest and West really begins to accrue here uh, this, this idea of the agrarian agenda versus the Hamiltonian agenda of industrialization becomes more and more pronounced. And it irks me that we don't discuss the run-up to the Civil War in this manner. You know, because at this point, keep in mind what's happening at this point with the Industrial Revolution, uh, a nation which is going to call itself a nation, the South, the Confederacy, they're behind the times, the Southern aristocracy. You've got to be kidding me. Aristocracies are on the way out. Why? Because of industrialization, technology, capitalism, 
Many people are leaving the land in many developing countries, and where are they going? To the cities to work in factories to become wage earners. Not so the South. Interestingly enough here, in 1860, to, show you, to give you a, a semblance of the difference, and there were, there were actually nine million living and breathing people here in the South by 1860. Just under four million are slaves. Their property, right? So there's five million, just over five million people who are considered people, whites. Out of the five million, they only have 110,000 and change people working in factories, in manufacturing. Up in the north, it's a different story. There's approximately 23 million people in the north. And instead of 110,000 and change people working in factories, up in the north, 1,400,000. Industrialization, commercialization, corporatization is coming. And obviously here, who's going to win the war that's going to result? 1861, 1865. <laughs> yeah, the North. Why? It's a mirror of the coming times here. Industri court industrialized war. That's going to kill the agrarian agenda. But, up, but getting into the 1800s, though, leading up to this, Yes, that race, for, that race for states, that race for territories. You're seeing slavery spread further south, more so Georgia, eventually Florida. States such as Alabama will appear, Mississippi will appear, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri. But then again, now this leads to another issue in Congress. You know, as the industrialization of the North proceeds, keep in mind Northern industrial interests, and they really don't care about the black. What they do care about is they don't want to compete with unpaid toilers. Because as industrialization starts up in the North, people, some people are moving off the land and moving to the factories. You got to pay them. Of course, keep in mind, some of these people are working 10, 12, 13 hours a day. And some of them are children. Getting maybe a half hour lunch and two 15 minute breaks, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And then they're back at it at 5 30, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning, working another 10, 12, 13 hours a day. I don't know what's worse, slavery or that. And there are no, there's, there's no OSHA here, folks. There's no EPA. There's none of this stuff. There's no unions, no nothing. But at least they're getting paid. That's a difference. I'll, I'll, I'll get to your question here in a minute. However, here at this point, again, you see this expansion in land. And so there are many, and the Southerners included here, what, you know, our, uh, article, article 4, Section 2, the three-fifths compromise, you know, as a sop to the South, as a sop to the South to put the country together, you know, blacks are considered property. They're not considered people. They're considered property, living and breathing property. Well, How does that work? And yet, since they're not considered living and breathing people, they are for their purposes of arranging congressional districts and giving, giving Southern representatives some sort of voting power in Congress. The Senate is easy. No matter how many states, no matter how big or how small, every state gets two senators. That's a gimme. But then again, you have to, you have to weigh up how many slave states and how many free states are going to enter the Union for political purposes. It's the house that really matters because not every state is the same size. Not every state is going to have the same amount of representatives. Is that going to change the amount of representation in Congress? Yeah, it will. Is that going to change the numbers of the Electoral College? Yeah, it will. And this is where things like the Missouri Compromise become extremely important. Yes. 
Well, people like George Washington, him and Martha, had it in their will that when they died, their, their slaves were supposed to be made free. But then again, when you have a state coming into the Union, like Missouri, uh, you know, uh, no, the slaves, the slaves can't be free unless their owner says so. Well, isn't that at odds with the Constitution? Uh, you know, consent to the governed, people are free, so on and so forth, right? Uh, enjoy the rights and liberties of the, uh, of the country. You know, well, now, no, no, not really. And they also put into the Missouri Constitution that free blacks, and get the word, get, note, of the word, note the term, mulattoes. You ever hear that anymore? I remember that as a kid. Well, there's a mulatto. You know, free blacks and mulattoes weren't allowed in Missouri. And the federal government went along with this. And so what you see here with the Missouri, Con and keep in mind, you know, once Louisiana was added as a state, 1812, much of what was once the Louisiana Territory becomes now the Missouri Territory. Now this leads to an issue too, the Northwest Ordinance. You weren't supposed to have slavery north of the Ohio River. Oh, well, guess what? Some of Missouri is north of the Ohio River. And yet, interesting here too, in after, after Louisiana, you know, the, the Missouri Territory here, you know, there are already people of Spanish and French origin living here. And so once the territory begins to be opened up, some 60,000 whites move into this territory. Guess where most of them come from? The South. So what does that mean? Slavery. And so now, some of, the northern, some of the northern interests are now becoming very, very antsy here. Gee whiz, we could have a slave state here. This will upset the balance of Congress. So James Talmadge here in, in February of 1819 puts forth an agenda. He does not want to see, he does not want to see slavery go beyond Missouri at all. And he also puts in his legislation to, become, to try to make it an amendment of the Constitution that, any, that slaves that reach the age of 25 can be free. That's the last thing Southerners want to see. And that passes the House. It'll die in the Senate, but it passes the House. And so when the session is over in Congress, they table this agenda. But this isn't going away. And in December, of 1819, guess what's back on the table? Missouri. And so uh, Jesse, Tom Jesse Thomas from, uh, Jesse B. Thomas, I believe his name is, from, from Illinois. Okay, Missouri can come in as a free state, as a slave state. However, looking at the rest of the territory here, because that, at, that this, it's going to come along here where the bottom part of what was considered the Missouri Territory becomes the Arkansas Territory. And so according to Jesse B. Thomas, anything 36 degrees, 30, 30 minutes, minutes north latitude now can be slave. Anything above that, no slave, free state. And so what, you know, Missouri, the Missouri, the state of Missouri will become slave because of the fact Maine, becomes part of the, becomes a state here. And so the northern interests will acquiesce here because of the Senate. Sure, there's going to be two senators from a slave state, but now there's going to be two senators from a northern state, Maine, which is broken off from Massachusetts. And so, again, they are very cognizant here of the balance. But again, don't think, don't think, you know, the anti-slave agenda here for most of these whites up north is because, for humanitarian reasons. It's for economic reasons. They don't want to compete with unpaid toilers. Now, this leads to another issue. Arkansas, Oklahoma. You know, the Southerners are going to get those states. They're going to get those states. However, this leads to another issue, too. Remember the Me Mexican-American War? Look at all those territories in the Southwest we get. Well, we get Texas before the Mexican-American War. Texas will come in as a slave state. 
But then again, as we push farther west, you know, some of these southern politicians don't care if slavery will work, if the southern agenda will work, they're going to push to have certain states become slave states anyway. Why? You can control Congress. Slavery isn't going to work too well in the New Mexican Territory. Slavery's not going to work too well in California or Oregon. California will come in as a free state, as will Oregon. But some of these Southerners don't care. It's what? The vote count. Representation. And so, at, you know, and some of these, sla and some of these, uh, some of these Southerners feel that these, some of the Northern interests that do not want them getting into New Mexico, that do not want them getting into California, that do not want them getting into Oregon, that didn't even want them in Missouri, that if they can stop us from expanding in these places, it's only a matter of time before they start telling us what to do in South Carolina. That's the feeling here. So is that, is that, is that establishing sectionalism in the country? Factionalism? Division? Yeah, it sure is. And that's going to play to people like Robert Barnwell Rhett in the 1850s, who's a real firebrand here. Get the name Robert Barnwell Rhett. The guy ran a paper called the, I think it was the, uh, I think it was the Charleston Mercury. Heavily anti-North, really vehement anti-Yankee, ardently pro-South. Robert Barnwell Rhett. Now that really sounds like a Southern name, doesn't it? You know, it doesn't that hearken people? Are, you Rhett Butler, right? Remember that? Yeah. Robert Barnwell Rhett. He, he took on that name. His real name was Smith. <laughs> but he was one of these ardent, fi I mean, a firebrand of Southernism. And so as this institution expands, the divisions of the country, and I'm going beyond John Brown here. I mean, John Brown was an ardent abolitionist. But the fact of the matter is, many of those up in the North opposed to slavery did so for economic reasons. We don't want to compete with unpaid toilers. Yet at the same time, you know, again, the, the, notice the title here, the edifice of cottonism. Cotton's growing, you know, this the idea of planting and reaping cotton and then selling it is growing by leaps and bounds. Yet much of it is processed where? Up north. And so this idea, I find this fascinating, this idea of the Jeffersonian agenda of the agrarian. I mean, keep in mind, uh, uh, again, just, just to rehash this for a moment, the Jeffersonian agenda you know, he was convinced that it's the farmer, the person that takes care of the land. The farmer is the real protector of Republican government because he and she, he or she has regard for the land. I think Jefferson understood that industrialization was coming, but he's against that, and he's against capitalism from the perspective that he thinks people moving to the cities and working in these factories have less of a regard for Republican government, representative government. Now there's a discussion for you. There's a discussion for you. He didn't, he was, he didn't care much, to be honest with you, for the proletariat. He was for the farmer, the agrarian agenda, the salt of the earth. They will forever protect rep rep Republican government because they have regard for the land. You know who else thought the farmer was the salt of the earth? Heinrich Himmler and the SS. Now, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Some of those guys in the some of these some of these Nazis had, didn't have much regard for factory workers. Holy Christ! You know, in in 1934. 35, 36, 37, Hitler would go to Bavaria. There, there was an area, I forgot the name of the area in Bavaria. Every year, he'd give a speech. It was to the farmers, the agrarians, the salt of the earth people. You know, a million would show up. A million to listen to him talk. A million. And the, and the, and the, 
and the SS, his, the Lieb standard, Adolf Hitler, his personal bodyguard, will push the women up front. Holy Christmas, the handkerchiefs are out. Some of these ladies are crying. They're reaching out. Christmas, you think the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show. And I'm not kidding. But he, Jefferson thought that the farmer was the salt of the earth and that he would forever protect Republican government. And so our documents, like the Constitution and Bill of Rights, would be assured with the farmer, not the factory worker, not the people living in the cities. Yet again, the agrarian agenda was based on what, though, in the end? Slavery. Is slavery a democratic institution? I don't think so. Yeah, well, again, though, again, again, when you go back to the basis of this, and that's, and that's what I'm going to get into at the end, the last talk here, because the last talk is called the Hamitic curse, the curse of Ham. Now, here we go back to the Bible. And so when you look at people like the Portuguese and later the Spanish reacting to papal bulls that, you know, places like Africa are primacy for the, 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 the premier civilization and the premier religion, Europeans and the Catholic Church. And what are these people in these areas? Gutter. Wow. You know, and I was in a discussion with this the other night, talking about uh, going back to the, what's going on in this country now, uh, come nimis absurdum, that papal bull pack passed by Pope Paul IV on July 14, 1555, relegating Jewish people to ghettos. Where do you think the Nazis got it from? Yeah, Jew Catholic Church ghettos. And so, uh, you know, and... You know, to be br brutally honest, Pope Paul IV was a little better than a gown-wearing bigot who should have been strung up by his Buster Browns. That's what you're seeing here in Europe. That's what you're seeing here in Europe. Is that going to be transferred here? Yeah, it sure will, because where did these white overseers come from? Europe. It's not hard to figure out. Yes. Well, there's been, there were tribal, di like here between the Indians, Yeah, it's, part of it's reward-based. You know, we'll leave you alone. You know, you got somebody you want to get rid of, this kind of thing in the end. And so tr certain tribes are capturing members of other tribes they don't get along with and turning them over to the traders. And that might mean, well, okay, we'll give you these people, just stay out of our territory. But then again, when you look at it this way, you know, keep in mind, at, at the beginning of the 19th century, this works for a, certain, for a certain period here. Beginning of the 19th century, only 10% of Africa is controlled by the European colonial powers. But, you know, I mean, slavery is gone, you know, by, by, the, by the slave trade has virtually ended at this point. And so in 1885 in Berlin, the Berlin Congress, the Europeans want to finish taking over Africa. And so, to prevent a general European war over colonies, uh, they meet in Berlin, the British, the French, so on and so forth, and, you know, gee whiz, you get this, you get this, you get this, and they divide up Africa. By 1900, 90% of Africa is overseen by Europeans. The United States went to this Congress. We didn't get anything. We sent observers. And so... Now, no longer are they taking the people. You don't need to take them. Let's go there and use them as laborers. <laughs> and, and, and take the wealth. That's basically what they want. They want the wealth. Resources. Resources. So now it's not just the people, it's to grab the resources. Well, what do you think's going on in the Middle East and Central Asia right now? Why do you think the United States, the EU, the Russians, the Chinese, so on and so forth, they want the resources? That's what all this is about. It's not about raising living standards and democratization. That's a lot of bunk. Resources and control. That's what it is. It doesn't, st it doesn't stop. It just morphs into something else. Yes? Yeah, I went into some of that when I did Revolt of the Planters. Uh, you're going to take that at no, when I do it at Noah Community. Okay, I'm going to. You'll you'll get that. 
you'll get that. Uh, that's part of this. That's the Nullification Act, 1928, 19, 18, 1828, 1832. Uh, again, that gets into the tariffs. You know, the northern, northern politicians and industrial interests want the tariffs because they want to protect their products from European imports. The South is afraid that with these tariffs, once the cotton, the rice, the sugar, the tobacco is exported, guess what's going to happen? It's going to get hit with tariffs to the in the destination countries. And so, yeah, that's, that, that, is a, that, is a, that is a big development on the road to 1860-61. And of course, keep in mind here, too, uh, by 1860-61, uh, the, the South, who controls the finance in this country at this point? Who controls most of the industry? Who controls most of the resources? Who, who has the largest ports? Who has most of the population? The North. And so some of these Southerners feel, well, you know, this is almost like what the British were doing to us in the 1730s, 1740s, 1750s, 1760s, where we were beholden to the British banks. Now we're beholden to New York, Philadelphia, so on and so forth. Well, we need to secede. Jackson stopped that when he was president. Uh, but it won't, but they'll succeed in doing that in 1860-61. And so the build, yes, that's part, you're quite correct. That's part of the buildup, the tariffs. And so either way here, when you look at it from the southern agrarian agenda or the northern industrial interests, what is it in the end that's going to help bring division here? The pocketbook? Money? Yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. And so is, it, is this part of that, of, that, of that dispute you always see? What did Marx say? What did Marx say when he wrote in the Communist Manifesto? Now we've got to bring this in, the Communist Manifesto. There's always that, there's always that dispute between the haves and the have-nots. That's characteristic of man. It's always been that way. Well, how are the Southerners going to, how are the Southerners going to, uh, going to uh, portray themselves? As the have-not. Let's get out of here. And so, you know, somebody, I think it was, I think it was uh, Seward, <laughs> who I think said, I think he said to Lincoln, when these southern states were beginning to secede, at last we're rid of these mosquito republics. That's not what Lincoln wants to hear, folks. That's not what Lincoln wants to hear. He wants to keep the country whole. No, at last we're rid of these mosquito republics. What a, way to, what a way to deem your fellow citizens. But maybe at this point, this is, <laughs> maybe at this point, this is how stark the division has become. Red states, blue states? <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many of you saw this, just to digress for a moment, but I, 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 the front line had a special on, uh, Date, on uh, Dayton, Ohio. And Dayton was, really was one of those, even though it only had 260,000 people at one point, it was one of those cities that mirrored American industrial primacy, like during the Second World War. Do you know out of a city of 260 million people, they had 70,000 union members, 260,000, 70,000 union members. That's a lot. And, you know, GM, how about National Cash Register? Remember them? Well, that city now has maybe 130,000 people in it, and whole neighborhoods are just derelict, uh, abandoned. It's almost like a mirror image of portions of Detroit, uh, portions of St. Louis. How about Camden? How about Newark? Yeah. And so, the, the, again, again the, the trends change here. So, interestingly enough, these divisions develop. You know, middle United States, some of these people in the middle, do you think they really like uh, the so-called elites on the coasts? And so you go back to the 19th century. Yeah, 
the Southerners are going to picture, portray themselves as the have-nots. You know, nobody likes me, everybody hates me. We're out of here. And so, secession. But again here, though, this idea, and again, you know, this idea of slavery underpinning the American economy also politically underpins the Southern aristocracy. And that I'm going to get into next week with the institution itself. Because there weren't very many slaveholders really in the South. There really weren't that many in the total population. And I'll have a breakdown for you next week. But uh, keep in mind here, this idea of the agrarian agenda is really not much different than the industrial agenda. Because since a few, since a few uh, uh, you know, well-endowed people here seem to have control of the slaves for the most part, that means they control what? Much of the land, which means they're going to control the state, the state legislators. Who has control of the land? The, so those, the southern aristocracy and those who are allied with them. But again, most southerners don't have slaves. And interestingly enough, too, the small farmer, the small farmer, the guy who's, the guy who's bringing on the horses and the cows and the pigs and the corn and so on and so forth, where is his market? It's not Britain, France, so on and so forth. It's the, it's the, it's the southern aristocracy. He, he is the one who's feeding the plantation system. He lives or dies with the plantation system. And most of these small farmers, if they have a slave, it might be one or two. Most really don't have much in the way of slaves. It's the plantation owners that do. Many of these plantation owners might have 10, 15, 20, but there are some with 50, 100, 150, 200. Interesting, too, you might get a plantation owner who owns more than one plantation. Jeez, Christmas sakes, it sounds like a corporation. And next week, I'll get into how they began to, uh, you know, as they're, ad, as they're expanding here, now you're going to be franchising. You're going to be leasing slaves, selling slaves, loaning slaves. And that means you're going to be taking from the slave families children who are as young as 5, 6, 8, 10, 12 years old and taking them from their families and shipping them off. Which to which is part of what I call the American concentration camp system because that's virtually what you're seeing here. Yes, somebody had it. Yes, yeah. It, there were there were nine million, approximately nine million people in the south. In 18, by 1860, about approximately nine million people. Well, uh, slaves being property, but let's call them people. Just under four million were black, and so that leaves five million whites. Round numbers. C correct. Correct, but the actual number of slaveholders, very low. And I'll have my a handout next week, I'll have, I'll have that for you. And so, again, it's the controlling interests here that control what you're going to call the Confederacy. And as I did in the Revolt of the Planters, you'll see this is a, this is a nation, the Confederacy, that will, you know, this, this is where you begin to see times changing with regards to human history. Uh, the, again, going back to the Industrial Revolution, capitalism, technology. Who commands most of the technology? <laughs> the North. And so you begin to see, this, this is going to be a progression here. A nation, uh, in a conventional industrialized war, you honestly think a nation of farmers is going to beat a nation of wrench turners? It's not going to happen. Factory workers? And you know who understands this as this war goes along here? Which makes him one of the greatest generals in the entire history of this country, Grant. Despite his bouts of, of taking vitamins G, I, and N. <laughs> this he understood. And that makes him one of the pivotal generals in the history of this country. Because he understood, and so did Sherman, by the way, economic warfare. And that's going to help end that so-called plantation system. Yes? 
Well, keep in mind who your president was in 1828, 1832, 1836 is Andy Jackson. Where did he come from? Yeah, Southerner, right? Yeah, he was more interested in keeping the country whole than worrying about the tariffs. And so, you know, Jackson in this, and who, and what's, and what's the state where he got most of the gripe from? South Carolina. And so, Jackson is going to, you know, Jackson is going to listen. I remember reading there was one meeting that they had. I think it was Henry Clay. Uh, and, or John, no, it was Henry Clay who was complaining about the tariffs and, and there were people in South Carolina who were going to secede and Jackson's listening to this. Ah, that's a good question. There's a good talk. Have tariffs ever worked? But Jackson is stating, Jackson's listening to this, and he, you know, Jackson's idea here is, you want to change things, you go through your elected officials. That's what you elected them for. If you don't like legislation that's passed or a resolution put forward, go through your elected officials to change same. You don't secede. That doesn't, that's not going to solve the problem. And Jackson also says, oh, by the way, the first one, the first one to secede is going to be hung from the highest oak tree because he already put federal troops on alert. I can imagine what Jackson would have done to the Bundys. <laughs> and so you, you see, you know, he takes control of this. But, of course, that's 1828, 1832. It's not 1858, 1860. By this point, maybe the situation's too far gone. Because you don't have the Robert Barnwell Retz yet here, uh, you know. Of course, Jackson's going to say, after he's out of after he's out of office after 1836, <laughs> I remember him saying one time. He says, "I have two regrets. I didn't shoot Henry Clay or hang John C. Calhoun." <laughs> that was Jackson. Yes. Well, the the you know the, the agrarian idea here is dying here. And the long-term progression here is a mechanized, industrialized economy, technology. And the idea of workers is growing, and, and you're not going to be able to stop this. Uh, you know, <clears throat> this, is, this is a tide that's becoming a torrent here. And at the same time, though, I mean, keep in mind, even still by 1900, 50% of the American public lives on a farm. But the coming times here, and, and, and again, you can see where this is going, because in 1865, there were 144,000 factories in this country. By 1900, 335,000. Uh, you know, this country produced $2 billion of manufactured goods in, in 1860. 11 and a half billion by 1900. We're up five and a half times in 40 years. We are becoming industrialization central. I mean, by the mid-1890s, we are the world's ranking economic power. And we're doing this because of industrialization and finance. You know, the dollar is coming on here. The dollar is coming on here. And so, and so this war that, that results Part of this is because of slavery, I'll give you that. Uh, but to me, a lot of this is that, 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 that political difference between the Jeffersonian idea and the hand. Well, go back to George Washington. What, George Washington spent part of his presidency as a referee between Jefferson and Hamilton. You know, he might not have been quite as astute with regards to doctrine as maybe Jefferson and Hamilton, but maybe he was the most level-headed because in his farewell address, he said the last thing this country needs is factionalism. He said it will tear it apart. What happened by 1860? Was George right? Yes, he was. Yes, he was right. And he was, a, he was not a fan of political parties either. He said, party breeds people who will be more allied to a party than the country they're in. That's what he said. In his, read his farewell address. It's a fascinating read. And he coincides with later Eisenhower when he states the danger of an overbloated military. 
And what does Eisenhower stay in 61? Right. And both have something in common. They were both generals. If anybody knows, right? Yeah. Anybody else have any questions or, or comments? Yes, sir. No, some of these, some of these ships were, were, were empty. I mean, some ship might leave England, drop off some goods in Spain or something, and then push on. It's not all that far at this point. And you're going to make up for the emptiness of the ship from maybe Spain to Africa from what you're going to get paid for when you bring these, bring these bodies over. But, I mean, keep in mind here, especially in the Caribbean and places of this nature, and keep in mind, if, if you're going to if you're going to pick up slaves in Africa, and let's say drop them off in the Caribbean, you're going to be picking up maybe sugar, rum, rum, right? Yeah, rum, rum, bringing it north to the to the northern colonies, picking up some lumber, maybe some paint or glass or whatever the case may be, shuttling it across the Atlantic, dropping it off, picking up maybe something in England, dropping it off in France or Spain, whatever the case, and then proceed south and then pick up the bodies again and proceed across the Atlantic. I mean, if you're a ship captain, especially a ship owner, you're not doing too bad here. You're really not doing too bad here. Does that help the northern shipping interests? Big time. Big time. Right. You know, that's, uh, you know, yeah, Mother Nature has a tendency here to, uh, I mean, that's like uh, you're talking about the winds, uh, those Japanese balloon bombs when they unleashed them in 44, 45. Uh, those rice bag, rice paper balloons, and they would release them in Japan, and the trade winds of the Pacific would carry them clear across the Pacific to the United States. Most of them didn't make it. They released nine, ten thousand of them, according to the the army, and there were some that made it here. In fact, uh, I I was doing some research with the uh, um, with, you know army records and found that there were actually a few just very few, that actually made it as far east as Michigan. Yeah. Uh, most of them didn't work, but a woman and four, you know, made in Japan, she says. Uh, a woman and five children were killed in Oregon on a Sunday morning when, you know, this balloon was hanging. They had 30 pounds of explosives. And, you know, kids are attracted to a balloon, right? Well, what do you think happened here? Bang! And it killed five, five, six people. For the most part, it was a failure. And these were made, uh, uh, many of these were made by teenage Japanese girls in homes. Oh, it's a war effort. So, but again, using Mother Nature here, the, the trade winds. So, somebody else had a hand up. Yes, yes, sir. Well, the poor... Yeah, the, the Portuguese, by this time, you know, going especially toward the end of the, uh, the, end of the 18th into the 19th century at this point, you know, Napoleon kind of ruined this when he invaded Spain in 188. I mean, Spain's declining as a power here anyway. And so when he occupies Spain, uh, how is he going to hold on to the Spanish, how is Spain supposed to hold on to those colonies in Central and South America? And guess what a lot of these people are going to do? They're going to bolt you know, a wholesale evacuation of the Spanish Empire here. And they're going to form, well, they call them republics, that's what they're going to form. And, and so it's hard to try to get those. In fact, when they, once, they, once they form these republics, they outlaw slavery. In fact, in 1826, there was a Congress in Panama and, you know, for these new countries like Colombia, El Salvador, Guatemala, so on and so forth. Mexico showed up to this. And these countries were supposed to put together some sort of supranational organization to protect themselves. It fell apart, this ardent nationalism even down there. But they all agreed on one thing, no slavery. And so the United States government was going to send some representatives to this. And the South filibustered. Why? Because they had outlawed slavery down there. And the South didn't want to be put into that picture of having, you know, we have slaves, but we're going to send representatives to a Congress that outlawed slavery. And so by the time the North overcame the filibuster, they sent two, rep two, two representatives from the House of Representatives down there. One died en route. 
By the time a representative named Sargent got there, Congress was over. This Congress was over. And you know who else sent representatives to this? England. And guess what? England inked trade deals with these republics at our expense. And in fact, with the Haitian Revolution, Toussaint Louverture, uh, this, uh, you know, this country did not, did not pump that. You know, the first black successful revolution here uh, against, against white overseers. And they didn't pump this. Why? They didn't want upheavals like that happening here. It's the last thing they want. And before this is over, I'm going to get into a few of these, like Nat Turner and so on and so forth. But, uh, but you know, for the most part, uh, slavery was pretty successful here. It was pretty successful. Of course, there are those that say, well, the reason you have your Second Amendment was to ensure the right of the white man to have a gun and anyone else, no. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, that put us kind of behind the times. Uh, well, the French, too. Why have slavery for? Uh, again, they're industrializing here. You know, capitalism is taking off the Industrial Revolution. Uh, people are moving off the land, moving to cities. That's happening now. That exodus is happening now. But the southern economy is not based on that. It's based on unpaid toilers. And at this point, yeah, there's really, the slave trade was outlawed here in 1808. That doesn't mean there weren't, there weren't, if you want to call them blockade runners, bringing people in. But for the most part, it's over. So what are they doing? They're breeding them here. They're breeding them here. And so fortunately for some of these plantation owners, there were a lot of black women brought over in the slave trade. Well, you need them to breed the slaves, don't you? Yeah, sure you do. And so, you know, you're having slave families with four, six, eight, nine children. And that's going to be when I talk about Harriet Tubman. That's her story. And so she's going to lose three or four of her, three of her brothers and sisters to the slave owner who's going to sell them off to other plantations that are opening up. They just, take, they just take the kids and just sell them, rent them, lease them, whatever the case may be. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty sordid institution. But having said that, did the slave here have an easier climate than being, than being sent down to Central or South America or those Caribbean islands? Yeah, there's a noticeable difference there. Noticeable difference. But that, that, doesn't, that doesn't preclude the treatment that went on here. That's not the point. But yes. Yeah, it, it, she's asking about what, what was the effect on Africa with regards to the population drain. You know, that's, I, I, can't, I can't really say for sure because when, when, when you're doing some research on this, there are numbers as to how many people were actually, we'll put it, forcefully deported. <laughs> Forced deportation is really what this is. I mean, this is human trafficking, a form of it, right? Uh, I saw there was one historian who said upwards of 50 million people. Well, I don't believe 50 million people. I don't believe it was that many. Uh, but the general, the general trend of numbers here is anywhere from 10 to 11 to as high as 15 million were taken and brought here. Now, Africa seemed to survive. There, are a, there were a lot of people in Africa, millions. And so, but was it a drain? Yeah, it was a drain. But did they repopulate? Obviously, they repopulated here over, over the years. But uh, did it impact Africa? Yeah, I, I, would, I didn't get into that end of this, but I would assume it did to a certain extent. But of course, if they're in a certain area, less people to one tribe, does that give another tribe primacy in taking that land? Yeah, of course it does. Yeah, of course it does. Again, what are we talking about? The desire to control the land. Who controls the land controls the agenda? You know, I mean, look, look at your own country right now. Who, you know, look, at the, look at the way uh, the, 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 the market is here. Who's the largest landlord in the country? Blackstone Group, a hedge fund. What does that tell you? So, yes. Yeah, that is the great question here. I'll get it, probably get into more of that next week when I talk about the institution itself. But there really weren't much in the way of complaints. 
Obviously not here because if the plantation owners are making money, where does some of the money go in the basket on Sunday? Well, let's be honest here. You know. But then again, looking at, looking at the interesting aspect here, you know, as the succeeding generation of slaves who, are, who don't come from Africa but are born here, actually begin to adopt some of the white man's culture, societal mores. I mean, what do they become here for the most part? Many are Baptists. Some, and eventually you see this, the African names begin to recede in importance. And what happens here? I mean, a slave, uh, a slave revolt leader, Nat Turner, that's not a name you're going to find in the Congo. Uh, you know, Jefferson, Washington, Hamilton, they become popular names. I remember as a kid, you know, I used to, when I used to really follow football a lot, there, there was a guy on the Minnesota Vikings, maybe some of you remember, he was a running back, Brent McClanahan. And I'm thinking, and this guy came from Notre Dame. I'm thinking, boy, what an Irish guy that is. He's black, he's black. <laughs> but I mean, that's, I find that interesting. That yes, they, they begin to adopt Christian names. Then it, well, yes, you're, yes, you, you see that. Now, there, some people are trying to recover their roots. But, but back then, you know, you're here. You might as well acclimate. The blues, the music, the blues. Where does that come from? Yeah. And again, what has transpired with that? Consult people like uh, um, Keith Richards, Eric Clapton, who do you think influenced them? People like uh, Skip Johnson, people like this, black musicians, you know, from the 20s and the 30s, jazz and blues. I mean, that's where you get that from. Wow, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yes, Skip James, people like this. Um, I mean, in fact, I used to be a fan of Cream, and... Um, to me, that was the best three-piece group there ever was. And I remember Jack Bruce talking about, the bass player, Jack Bruce, talking about this. Now, here's a guy they sent, his parents sent him to three conservatories to be trained as a classical musician in England, Scotland, and Italy. And the, again, these guys like Skip James, these, these black musicians, heavily influenced them. And I remember them taking that a song, I think it was Skip James that wrote that song, I'm So Glad, and they, took it, they turned it from a two or three minute song into a 10 minute concert piece. And, but they were influenced by these black, blues, jazz musicians. That's fascinating. And so what comes out of slavery, you're seeing on a stage here at the Fillmore. Wow, yes. There were Southerners who thought the slaves should be treated with some sort of dignity. But then again, that's still not freedom. And then again, treating them with dignity perhaps, but then again, the overseer's lash is not all that far away. And I'll get into that more next week, because that's part of the system. That's part of the system. And so if you're going to maintain primacy over these people, sometimes certain forms of discipline are required. One more thing, uh, starting next week, uh, they're gonna have, um, on a monthly basis, they're gonna try this, uh, a current events discussion. And it starts next week on, uh, let's see, the 15th. And that's a, um, It's in the evenings, by the way. Uh, yeah, it's a Tuesday, right. And the time is 7 o'clock at night. And the topic is going to be the analysis of the midterm elections. Well, you think this is dour. And so, in fact, I'm supposed to be the one leading this, so um, if you want to have some fun, 
be here next Tuesday night, the 15th at 7 o'clock. Now, exactly where in the library they're going to have this, I don't know yet. They haven't told me. Upstairs? Oh, okay. That's right, we'll go in the parking lot. Not much room. Otherwise, have a good evening. Take care. Thank you.